Okay, this chapter is going to talk about um, populations and communities, and uh, we're going to focus on a species, a couple of species, the um, the coyotes and wolves, and kind of what's happened in the United States because of um, practices of early colonization. So, what happened is wolves and other top predators were extirpated, were killed, removed from most of the United States to prevent unwanted deaths from livestock, right? So wolves would go in and kill sheep or um, cows or chickens or whatever. And so um, as the U.S. colonized more and more of the United States, um, the wolves were really pushed out of uh, the areas where humans lived. Also removed forests um, to put plants and cities and um, human habitation on and all of this allowed for the um, increase in coyote populations um, as the wolf populations receded so coyotes are originally from the Great Plains of the US and Mexico and in some of the deserts out west um, and they prefer these open habitats uh, created by humans. So after the um, wolves had been taken out um, and these open habitats were created by humans, it was prime habitat for the coyotes to move in. All right, so we're gonna talk about this phenomenon kind of over and over as we're talking about the growth of populations um, and the interactions between species within communities. So if you remember, a population is a group of the same species within a small area, um, maybe in, you know, depending on the species, you'll, you'll have different populations and, and different sizes within those populations. Um, so when talking about wolves or coyotes, you would talk about a, a pack of wolves. Um, or a group of urban coyotes surrounding a city, and that would be the population that you would be um, maybe studying for scientific reasons. So again, a population is a group of interbreeding, reproducing individuals. A biotic community is a group of populations within an area and um, is looking at the interactions between different species. Um, populations will change according to the birth uh, rate and death rate, uh, how many are coming in from other populations and how many are leaving to other populations, so immigration and emigration. And um, when you add those up, you're going to get a population increase or decrease. A population growth then is the change in the population. And if a population is in equilibrium, that means its population is stable, it's not growing or decreasing. And so we look at population growth in terms of a growth rate. Um, as So this would be the increase of individuals over time. They use curves to model uh, population growth. Um, and we'll look at some of those. So the first one is exponential growth. Um, so what happens when organisms have unlimited resources or access to unlimited resources. And this is really what happened to the coyotes. The coyotes were restricted to these this Great Plains and desert region of Mexico and the United States. After all, the wolves were removed from all of these areas, or at least decreased significantly. Um, now they have access to all these resources and they're unlimited in their habitat, uh, in a lot of the food resources. Um, and so their population exploded, had a dramatic increase in these areas. Um, and if you have more females, you have a greater uh, potential to increase or higher value of the growth rate, which is abbreviated as a little r. So what happens in nature is usually this population expo explosion is only for a period of time and the reason is because eventually these resources are no longer unlimited right there there is a limit to how how much prey is available in these areas how much uh, land is available um, and so the limit of these resources is also known as the carrying capacity and abbreviated as the capital K 
So if other factors other than resources limit the growth, um, before the carrying capacity you have what's called logistic growth, which is kind of this S-shaped growth. Um, exponential growth is more J-shaped, and we'll show another curve of that. The, um, <coughs> The growth rate near the carrying capacity is zero, so that would be where it is um, approaching equilibrium. The maximum rate of population growth then occurs halfway to carrying capacity or at this inflection point. Okay, so here then we have two um, types of growth. The blue would be our exponential growth rate where access to um, resources is unlimited. Sometimes, and generally, if you have this population explosion, it's followed by a crash where the resources are completely uh, diminished. Um, logistic growth would then be this red line where you see um, the population hovering around an equilibrium near the carrying capacity. All right, so that's population growth. Generally, how population of organisms of, of different species grow. Alright, community <coughs> ecology is the study of interacting organisms within a community. Again, this is multiple species and their interactions. Uh, the possible interactions between two species are either positive, negative, or neutral. Okay, so both can benefit and that would be called a mutualism. Both can um, be negatively effective, and that would be competition. Um, and so we'll go through each of these. So first, predation, which is where one species is positively affected and one is negatively effective, uh, affected. Um, so this is any relationship where one organism feeds off or takes resources from another. Um, and generally, a predator uh, feeds on prey, but you also have some other types, including parasites, where they that you have a smaller host or, or a smaller um, parasite, um, which then attaches to the host, which is larger. Um, um, it includes things like mistletoe, which is a parasitic plant. Um, endoparasitic worms which live in the guts of species. You have fungal parasites such as athlete's foot which lives on the skin or these are little lampreys which attach to blood uh, to fish and suck their blood. Alright so predation is one type of um, uh, in interaction. In, in a community. All right, competition is the next. This is a negative interaction between two species. They're both generally going for the same resources, so the presence of one uh, negatively affects the other, and vice versa. Um, and this happens when you have an overlapping of a niche or common resource use. So um, the well, there are two types. Intraspecific competition would be between. Uh, individuals of the same species, so these two coyotes, um, or if there are too many coyotes in an area, they may be competing for the same resources. Interspecific competition then is between different species. So wolves and coyotes generally um, use similar resources. Wolves are bigger, so they are able to take down larger prey, but they generally aren't, weren't found in the same area because they would compete for the for the same resources. <clears throat> and so the removal of wolves from eastern North America and western North America allowed for this competition to be removed, and that competition was keeping these coyotes in check in a lot of these areas. So once that competition was removed, um, coyotes were allowed to expand. This was at least one factor which allowed them to expand into that native wolf range. Now one of the ways in which um, species interact or are able to not compete is to um, use resources different, differently. And in fact, 
no two species, according to the competitive exclusion principle, can have the same resource use in the, at the same time and place. Um, and so they must have some other mechanisms for weeding out these different types of resource use. Ecosystems are very heterogeneous, right? The resources within them are not all the same. And so these differences in resource allow for different species to specialize on different things, okay? So some of these might include the availability of light or temperature or minerals or water. All these things, of course, vary within a landscape. And this results in resource partitioning. Great example of this is there are different types of warblers which will all live in the same tree, but they will eat different insects um, or eat different um, things within the tree and, and live in different parts of the tree. Okay, and so you can see this um, if you look at different species of bird within this tree. So they are partitioning the resources in slightly different ways, which allows them to not to exclude each other competitively. All right, mutualism is a positive interaction for both. So here, both species benefit from um, their association. And this creates an efficiency in an environment. When they work together, resource use is efficiently used. And it can vary from casual benefit to complete dependence. So some examples are lichens. These are, uh, they kind of look like um, leaves which grow on the bark of plants or on rocks. Um, and what is actually um, lichen is a combination of multiple species, bacteria and plants, which are living together. Um, and they are providing, like, like the plant will provide shelter and photosynthesis for the plants, which are providing extra nutrients. Um, and so their mutualistic interaction allows them to grow and survive better than they could with um, if they were on their own. So some other examples include the sea anemone and the clownfish, a cleaner shrimp and fish, bees and flowers, um, both benefit from their interactions. Other interactions, commensalism is a positive um, neutral interaction, so like this cattle egret hitching a ride on this big old bison here, um, or water buffalo. Um, it's getting a free ride, but the water buffalo really isn't affected, doesn't really slow him down much. Immensalism is a negative neutral interaction, um, and that would be where, excuse me, that would be where, um, again, one is negatively influenced and the other has no benefit from it. All right. Um, Another principle which is very important for populations is evolution and communities. Um, this was first discovered by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. Wallace. Um, they independently came up with uh, the theory of natural selection, um, evolution via natural selection. Um, when they did, they didn't have a, they had a lot of evidence for it, but since their publishing of their um, respective works on evolution, a lot of evidence has come out to support it, including DNA, genetics, mutations, um, also evidence in the fossil record, um, which show that this is a very sound theory in science. So definition of biological evolution is the modification of the gene pool of a species by natural selection, so, so, so uh, factors of the environment, which over the course of many generations will affect the expression of traits. This has been um, observed in nature in, um, in certain types of moths, which are found in, these were found in England. During the Industrial Revolution, um, these white moths were, were more abundant originally, um, but after factories started spewing out lots of ash, it would cover the trees in ash. And then um, that made these black uh, variants of the same species of moth more camouflage. And so they started to increase in frequency in the population over 
periods of time. And so you see a shift in the traits within a population over many generations, um, and that would be um, evolution occurring. Now, um, when a species faces a new powerful selection pressure, a species can do one of three things. So if an environment changes, or if a species colonizes a new area with a different environment, these are its options. And humans are really a new powerful selection pressure affecting a lot of um, species. So it can adapt. It can, um, based on variation within its trait, those new, uh, those traits that are favorable to the new environment will be selected for and better represented. They can migrate to a new area. So if you are a mobile animal, such as a bird, and we see this with a lot of songbirds, um, in response to global warming, they are um, occurring in more northern latitudes. So they can find that optimal range of temperatures, which is good for them. Or they can go extinct. So if they cannot adapt or migrate, they will simply um, hit the limits of their tolerance and, and have to die. The species that are most affected are specialized to limited resources and small geographic ranges and can't move very well. Um, and so those are the ones that are going extinct more often. All right, but sometimes this change in um, selective pressures will cause speciation to occur. Um, and this has occurred um, in, uh, or has been demonstrated in the Galapagos finches, which were discovered by Do Charles Darwin, where you have a series of islands off the coast of Ecuador, and uh, one mainland species of finch colonized these islands, and the different selective pressures there led to different species of, of finches from one. It requires reproductive isolation in populations to prevent gene flow and allow for speciation to occur. Um, sometimes it can also occur through hybridization, okay, and which is most common in plants. Now, interestingly enough, the coyote and the wolf can actually form hybrids um, which are fertile. And so um, this actually happened for a population which is now in northeastern United States. Um, as the coyotes um, moved more and more east, especially along the northern border where there were still wolves, such as up in Canada, some of those coyotes hybridized with, um, with wolves. And so now these northeastern coyotes have a lot of wolf genes within their population, which makes them a little bit larger. Um, so we may have the, the hybridization of a new type of, of species, maybe called the koi wolf. All right, so sometimes you have species which are introduced to a new area coming from another area. Um, and this can have devastating effects on an ecosystem. An example of this is the American chestnut blight. Uh, American chestnuts were this large tree which were uh, along in a lot of the eastern forests. And a, an invasive species of fungus came and wiped them all out. So they are, they're still there, but they can't grow very tall because of this blight. Kudzu is another example. You see that around here a lot an invasive species from Japan, which is taking over many landscapes uh, and causing a lot of destruction to uh, some of the natural habitats along the southeast and eastern United States. Uh, some of them include pests such as fire ants and zebra mussels. Zebra mussels are outcompeting all other native types of mussels along the um, eastern waterways, uh, a marine pest. Um, pigs and goats can eat um, all sorts of uh, vegetation and uh, goat pigs will eat anything, so wild feral pigs will will totally change 
um, ecosystem dynamics. And regulation of these invasive species can be very, very hard um, and is usually very complex and requires um, interactions between the biotic community and are specific to the, the, the ecosystem from which they came. So generally in the ecosystem they came, they aren't very popular because they have competition, um, they have um, maybe an herbivore or, or a, a predator which keeps their population in check and then they move to this new area, they don't have those um, ecosystem checks and so they are allowed to they, they are effectively have unlimited resources and are having these exploding populations. So some remedies to um, invasive sp species include finding new habitats. Um, oh, sorry, this is why they are, their population is exploding, which is the exponential growth rate, the exponential J curve. So to stop the introduction of invasive species, um, it often or effective often um, involves reducing the amount of imports uh, of plants or animals or shipments or generally monitoring um, the things that are coming into an area to prevent you know um, plants or animals from hitching a ride and then uh, exploiting the new environment. Um, some things that have also been effective are using a natural enemy. So importing a, a predator or um, some type of, of herbivore to keep those populations in check. We've had a lot of mishaps with that as well and we'll talk about some of those in class. Okay, so that's it for population